In 10 years of being an advocate for children and having worked for Bernardo's and Plunkett and many others, I've continually come across, up against, you know, the, we have the very best evidence, all that stuff from Heckman and others, and it butts up against ideology. It's tough. And we have to keep questioning the pervading ideology. And one of the best ways we can do that is by bringing children's voices to the fore. So in some of the consultations that I've been involved in with children over the years, these are some of the things that we continually hear. Of course, families are the main source of support, but children want their families. They want their parents to, to be well supported. They know that government and community have got a role. Parents need to stop being angry. I've got a nine-year-old and a four-and-a-half-year-old. I know how hard it is, the, you know, the, the pressures of parenting and you know, the, the com everything competing for your time and energy. But kids have said, please, mum and dad, stop being angry. They want their parents to have time to play. Sadly, in an environment where we privilege paid work over everything else, our kids are missing out on that unhurried time when their children, when their parents are available to them emotionally and can play with them. And children have told us that hunger is a significant issue. They want food in schools and that adequate family income is needed. From the voice of the, chil from the children themselves, and when we take this stuff to decision makers, it's pretty hard for them to argue with. It's not UNICEF saying it, it's children themselves. When we launched the Tech for Kids campaign up in Auckland in um, May, one of the children asked a question of the political candidates. Why does the government fund the America's Cup? It was a very good question. It's a question that many of us would like to ask, but to have it coming from you know, the mouth of a nine-year-old, you know, it was quite poignant. And I think Part of what we are doing in building this social movement for children and children and starting to bring a focus onto our younger citizens is that we are having to question what do we value as a society? We've had a free market economy for a period of time. Is it working? It's clearly not working for our children. How have we structured our society to support our parents or not? And so, along with children, I think it's vital that we question some national priorities. At the same time, we also have to question some of our own priorities as parents and as those working for children and with children. So, in being advocates, what are some of the things that we need to consider? First of all, what is advocacy? Essentially, it is speaking for and on behalf others. But when we are talking about children, we have to be doing that advocacy with them and enabling them to bring their voice and stand alongside us and be heard with us too. I think increasingly people are understanding that advocacy is really legitimate activity. Within our own families, there will be times that we have to stand up for a child. Within our schools, within our community, sometimes we have to you know, go beyond the call of duty and stand up for a child, ask for additional help and support for them so that they can learn, or additional support and services for their families so that their families can take care of them. Advocacy is about creating the conditions for public health and well-being. So however we do that within our families and whānau or within our community or at a national level, it benefits everybody when our children do better and we, when we stand up for them. There are times we have to advocate for individual children or for groups of children. It's, you know, it may be that there are a group of children, disabled children or others who need a particular focus. And of course we have to advocate at the national level too. Sometimes that advocacy is public. It's when, you know, when we march, when we stand up together in public campaigns, sometimes it's private. It might be that we have to have a, a quiet word with parents or with others. In every case, it's about getting a better deal for our kids, and therefore it's something we can all and should be doing. So when I think about some of the circumstances we need to create for our children so that they do better, 
I think it's about creating a nation that values our children and that we, re we respect their human rights and we support parents. And obviously we need child-centred public policy. We've seen the consequences of policy that ignores children having really taken its toll on child health and well-being. We need jobs that pay well and that are flexible so that we can manage that uh, juggle of parenting and work. We need good quality services and we need safety nets to be available and accessible. And in a conversation last week with the Ministry of Social Development, I raised with them the need for complete transparency around our welfare system so that we know whether or not families are getting what they are entitled to. They said, oh, I think that might cost a bit, which suggests, of course, that families are missing out on the safety nets that they need. And of course, we need people working together, linked into strong, child-friendly communities. And we need healthy, educated families in Fano. Everybody knows that a parent's education level is a key predictor of child well-being outcomes. So we have to be enabling parents to continue to learn. And it's a great shame that the training incentive allowance has been removed and that community education has been cut because the benefits to Fano of that ongoing ability to learn and to our children is very, very clear. So if you think about this picture that I've painted of what we need, it means we actually need change at lots of different levels and we need to be advocating at different levels as well. So because getting it right for kids is about policy, it's about practice, it's about attitudes and beliefs, we have to be prepared, all of us, to grow and learn and change the way we think about children and the way that we work with them. We have to be bringing our voice and theirs into central government and to local government. And so one of the things that UNICEF does is that we have a child-friendly cities framework and we're working with councils around the country to promote a new way for them to work in partnership with their communities to build communities that are child-friendly. And of course, health services, schools and early childhood education, neighbourhoods, communities and families, as I've described. So one of the ways that we've gone about our advocacy in recent years is uh, through the Every Child Counts Coalition, and you're probably aware that Plunkett, Bernardo's, UNICEF, Save the Children and Mana Dedeke and others work together, and we've been working together for about 10 years to really bring a focus at the policy level onto children. I think we're seeing some change. I do believe that we're starting to make some progress and, and you know, it'd be interesting to get your sense of where things are at in your communities, but it feels like at the national level, we might be starting to make some progress in terms of getting political parties um, focused on children uh, and starting to um, change their policies so that we get some improvements. And then there's tick for kids. So this is a, you know, it's an election campaign. And this year, early in the year, when we started thinking about what we needed to do in the general election, we thought, well, you know, we'll do what we've always done, which is identify a set of policies that we want the political parties to sign up to, and we'll see how we get on. Then we thought again, and we decided that a smarter way for us to campaign this year was to be holding events up and down the country and to be asking a smart set of questions of all of the political parties. We suspected there would be no change in the government and we needed to keep national well engaged. So our campaign has been about having community events and really creating a conversation. So what we saw happen during the election campaign was that candidates were being questioned about child poverty and about policies for education and the things that we know make a big difference in the lives of children and their families. And most importantly, perhaps, we started to see some changes in public opinion polls. So there were polls that were showing clearly a high level of public concern about poverty and inequality, and we haven't had that before. We achieved that because 
we were working in partnership. So we had about uh, 38 organisations involved at the end of the campaign, and you can see here the logos of many of the organisations involved. And, you know, I really think there's something to be said for all of us joining hands around these issues and recognising that what we're building over time is a different way of being as a society, and we can only do that if we're really smart about how we work. And, um, you know, I think also it's fair to say that for some organisations, there's a kind of safety in numbers thing about this as well. Um, there are a number of NGOs who have spoken to me about actually being quite fearful about saying what exactly is happening for children in this country. And it really concerns me that we might be living in an environment where people feel hampered to speak the truth about what's happening for our children. We have to be bold about this. And if that means that we have to work in partnership in order to be bold, then let's do that. Because our children are counting on us to talk about what we're seeing and hearing and what it is that's happening for them in their communities and in their families on a day-to-day -day basis. What came through in the Tick for Kids campaign is that everybody had something different to contribute. And so in the case of the NZDI, there were lots of amazing events and some great leadership. UNICEF played its part with writing and design and things. Amnesty International did a comms plan. And you can see there are others there as well. But it was all of us connected, sharing on social media and doing our mainstream media work as well and doing all of those events that we were able to build a campaign that got the notice of the political parties and the candidates. So one of the things that has come through in that collective campaigning, of course, is we've got to have that change at the national level, but what can we do in our own communities? So, you know, there'll always be government policy that we won't agree with and that we have to rally against and raise concerns about and communicate about. But what are some of the things that we can do closer to home? And I've been seeing some amazing examples of actually really exciting, you know, magical things happening in communities because of the leadership that is there in those places. So I've mentioned already the child-friendly city framework, and that's for councils and communities. But in Taita, in the Hutt Valley, there's a project called Common Unity, which you can find on Facebook. And um, essentially what's happening at Epuni School is that parents are being brought into the school. There's a community garden. They're learning how to garden, how to harvest and preserve some of that food, how to cook nutritious meals. And together, that community is learning a new set of skills, but they are also supporting and sustaining each other in a really beautiful way. And one of the things that came out of that work was that the children said, actually, we're cold at night. We don't have enough blankets. So they set about at the school teaching the children to knit and then also put a call out around the Wellington region to say, knit one small square and donate your knitted square so that we can make blankets for our children. And, it, and it's become a really beautiful, I think, a really great example of how children are learning you know, to, to solve some of their own problems, but also the community is coming around them in a really great way. And I know that there are other great examples of schools as hubs. And just in the past week, following the election, when the government's been talking about some new solutions on child poverty, one of the things that appears to be on the agenda, just based on the conversations we've had with government departments this past week, is a greater investment in schools as hubs. So some of you will be doing that already. And I guess the challenge will be, how does that happen in a way that doesn't burden already busy teachers and school administrators? So obviously, you know, some community volunteers and others need to be a part of that picture. But there's real benefit to communities in having that kind of model where a variety of services are located in the one place, where there's community-led development happening, in and around that hub and opportunities for parents to keep on learning. Rebuilding neighbourhoods, you know, we're, with changes in our economy and in the past couple of decades we've had, you know, our neighbourhoods look vastly different because they're empty, because everybody's at work. 
And so how do we recreate neighbourhoods that work for families? And sometimes I think we need almost some traditional ways of being, but with a modern view of children, so that we're connected to each other and supporting each other and our parents can do uh, the best that they, they can possibly do for their children. I've already talked about the need for parents to be able to continue learning, and in some parts of the country we've got real challenges when it comes to literacy and the ability of our parents to read to their children. We know that that's vital, so supporting adult literacy development is another opportunity for all of us at the community level to improve what's happening for, for families. For UNICEF, we already do some work with a number of schools around the country on human rights education in schools, and it's something that I'm interested in, the potential of growing, because we know that when we understand our own rights, we are more likely to uphold the rights of others. So there are real benefits within the school environment when it comes to reducing bullying and creating an environment that's optimal for learning. So if, if ever there, there's a hunger within the NZDI to talk to us about that, I'd love to explore that possibility. And then importantly, at the community level, all of us, if we see it, to know what we're looking at when it comes to abuse and neglect and to know what course of action we need to take. And there's an, an area of work that I've mentioned already, the workforce capability under the Children's Action Plan, and that'll be one of the key things that comes through there. So there's lots of opportunity available to us right now, and I think that um, we need to probably pick a few of them and run really hard on them. But when I've been thinking about what's coming up in the next few months and how we can work together. These are some of the things that occurred to me. I've, the government work on child poverty, well, you know, it remains to be seen whether that's real or not, but the public polls are showing a high level of concern about poverty and inequality, and I think that's why the Prime Minister has said that they want to do further work on this. Um, we're going to have an art exhibition in Parliament on the 5th of November called The Big Picture, and it's children's art from right around the country, from schools, and some of you have probably been involved in it, children telling us what um, would make their communities better. And we're going to display that artwork in Parliament so that we take children's voices straight to the decision makers in November and we can um, show them what it is that kids are saying needs to happen for them. Another thing coming up in the next couple of months, and I think you'll be interested, obviously, in the education part of this, but the government is currently preparing its next report to go to the United Nations Committee on the Rights of the Child. So they will, in December, put their draft report out, and we will all have the chance to comment on it. Um, so, you know, obviously things like charter schools and things you'll be wanting to have a look at, but also what's happening in special education and how well or not New Zealand is doing uh, for Māori, Pacifica and also for disabled children and education will be critical questions for the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child. The report will come out in December and it'll be available for comment through to February. So it's a good opportunity for you to have your say on the government's report. We will then follow that up with our own NGO report and we're really keen to make sure that when the shadow report or the alternative report or the NGO report, whatever you want to call it, when we send our report to the UN, that it reflects your experience out there in the community. So your stories and examples of, of whether or not New Zealand is upholding children's rights can be fed into that report so that the UN gets a more accurate picture. We're also looking at what has to happen in terms of our collective advocacy. So on the 27th of November, we've got a big Every Child Counts and Tip for Kids meeting coming up where we have a think about how we work together in the next few years. And we'll be, all of us, working to make sure that we bring children's voices through to that UN report and to other things that we're doing as well. And I've already mentioned some of these points here. I just want to encourage you to um, you know, engage in this debate within your families and communities, as I know that you will be, but to, to help to build awareness. Because it seems to me 
that we might be right on the cusp of some social change around understanding that we've got to do much more for our children. One of the ways that I argue this case is not just a child rights argument or a social justice argument and the $10 billion spend argument, but as an ageing society, right now, for every one person who retires, we've got two and a half people entering our workforce. That's about to change big time. In 10 years' time, for every person retiring, we're going to have just one person entering the workforce. So we have to have children and young people who are healthy, educated, protected, and participating in, the, in their economy and their society. So there are very, very real questions and pressing, pressing uh, reasons for us to address this. My vision is one of an Aotearoa New Zealand that values its children, that enables their participation and makes sure that they all do well, not just groups of them or some of them, but every child in Aotearoa New Zealand. And I'm grateful to have the opportunity to talk with you. Now, I'm keen for, shall we break into our groups now? So what we're going to do is spend a bit of time around your tables. You're, you're beautifully set up for group discussions. And um, it's a chance for you to have a think about what more you can be doing locally uh, and also to have a think about whether there are questions